Hello, everyone. Welcome to a, another SANS OSINT live stream. We have uh, a lot of people joining us from around the world. I see Japan, UK, US, Sweden. Very cool. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, this is a live stream, so feel free to drop your questions and comments uh, as we move through our discussion this morning. Uh, I'm John Turbush. I am a co-author of the SANSEC 587 Advanced OSINT class, along with uh, the two co-authors that are joining me here today, Nico Dakins and David Mashburn. Hey, Nico, how's it going today? Hey, I'm doing good over here in the Netherlands. So welcome, everybody. I'm looking very much forward to today's uh, talk. And David, you ready to go? Sure thing. Good morning from the uh, U.S. East Coast. Uh, looking forward to a discussion today. It's going to touch on some things that I really like. So uh, very happy to have our guests here with us today. Awesome. And then that brings us to our guest, Stephen Harris at Nix Intel. Uh, he is going to talk to us today about geolocation, looking at imagery and things like that. And then we'll also get into some tracking of vehicles and and it's sort of a related topic sometimes. So Stephen, welcome. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. Thanks for the intro. It's really good to be here. So um, my name is Stephen Harris. I, I go by the, the pseudonym Nick Sintel uh, on Twitter and other places. Um, I am an instructor candidate for SANSEC 487, uh, which is uh, SANS's introductory OSINT course. And in the rest of the time, I work for Complex, which is a, a cybersecurity company, and I work as an open source intelligence specialist in, uh, there. My background before that, uh, where I, I worked, um, I guess, predominantly in OSINT, was in law enforcement. I was a detective for uh, for about 10, 10 12 years, um, investigating crimes and, and learning how to use open source intelligence to do that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, really grateful to be here to discuss it with you all. Fantastic. Um... Well, I, th I think we should maybe do a little bit of an intro of what we're talking about when we're talking about geolocation. I mean, it's kind of self-defined there, but as far as OSINT, what, what kind of things are we doing with geolocation? Okay, so uh, if you want to summarize what geolocation is, it's basically, um, it's a strand of intelligence, a strand of OSINT where you have an image or a video or collection of images and videos, and you are trying to find out where those images or videos were taken. And there are many, many different reasons that you might want to do that. Um, but it, it's in a nutshell, it's here's an image, here's a video, where and when was it taken? And then that's usually the, the basis for all the other questions you might want to ask about what's in the, in the image. Awesome. Um, so, when you were working as, you know, an investigator, working in law enforcement, how often did you really find yourself doing this? I know my background as a private investigator working in cyber threat intelligence and, and that sort of thing. Now, I haven't done a whole lot of it, but I know there are people that do do a lot of it, journalists and so on. So maybe give us an idea of, of how often this in reality comes up. Yeah, and um, geolocation is great because it's really broad and it has a lot of uses uh, across different disciplines. So um, obviously, I use it in law enforcement, and I'll I'll, I'll talk about that shortly actually because there's some really good examples. But um, people who work in investigative journalism, for example, um, have really taken on the idea of geolocation and are using that to verify um, information stories or disinformation stories in the media and ex expose propaganda and things that are happening, things like that. Um, in law enforcement investigation, which was my own background, um, you, geolocation is kind of funny because you have so many other tools and resources at your disposal uh, as an investigator that geolocation sometimes got pushed to the side. But where it really became more important was with the explosion of social media and people taking photos of everything, of themselves, of the places they went to. And where I found myself using geolocation was... Um, Investigations around uh, missing people, for example, um, and also investigations around um, child abuse. So uh, in the team I worked with, 
one of the jobs that we had was to try and identify victims of child abuse. So where they were in the world, ideally who they were, or where the images were taken and so on and so on. Um, <clears throat> so how geolocation work for that? Well, you have all sorts of, I guess, powerful tools available to you as, as a law enforcement investigator, but sometimes they are not enough. If you have an image of a suspect or if you have an image of a victim, and you want to know where they are in the world, well, there's no magic tool in your toolbox that will that will do that for you. So um, how we, we kind of use geolocation to do that was, well, starting with what we know about this, in, this particular investigation and look at what is in the image and try and figure out all the little data points that we can get in, the, in these images and research those to try and find out, find out where people are. I, I think, Probably, I, I've spoken about this publicly because um, it's, I guess it's a case I can talk about. Um, but my favorite example of this was probably about three or four years ago now when we were investigating um, a young girl who's in her early teens at the time who was being um, trafficked um, across Europe, going, going from Albania to Greece to Italy and various places. And our, although we were in the UK, we had in one of our investigations come across um, images of this girl and we knew the person she was traveling with um, who was who was sort of organizing the exploitation of the girl it, it's quite unpleasant stuff but we, we had a, a mission to to find who they were where they were so the girl could be rescued and we were using Facebook a lot to do this because the the suspect in the case every time she moved to a new location um, she would post on Facebook I've just moved here I so we knew roughly where in Europe they were but Knowing even the right country isn't really enough to be able to go and find somebody. But what we found that the suspect had this habit of every time she moved to a new location, she would update her Facebook. She would take a selfie um, saying, hi, everyone, here's my new house. Here's where we are. And they were all indoors, which is frustrating because identifying a location from indoors is, is kind of difficult. Um, but then she took one uh, of a selfie of herself out in a street. And although the suspect occupied about 80% of the picture, we knew roughly what region of Italy she was in, but we were able to identify things like um, the color of the houses on the side of the street, the way the drain pipes were set out on this particular street, uh, that there was car parking on both sides of the street. It was a wide main road. And when we, we pulled out all these specific details from the image and then looking at all the towns in that particular region of Italy where she was we found that there was only one location that actually matched and once we used I think Google Street View it was we found we could find the exact spot where the suspect had taken a selfie uh, just a few days before outside the house she just moved into and we were then able to pass that to the Italian authorities saying look you've got child trafficking case um, here's, who's, here's your victim. More importantly, here's your suspect. We can show where they are to within one or two doors, and then the Italian authorities have to do the rest. So that's an example of uh, no magic, no law enforcement powers, just um, think using geolocation um, to and applying it in investigation to get the results. So it's very quite simple, but also very powerful. Very cool. Very interesting. Yeah. It, it reminds me of an example that I had that was somewhat similar where um, some young children were being abducted. And well, just like you said, it was all indoors. So it's pretty hard to determine where they are. But in this case, it was eventually you figured out that it was in a hotel. And this is where I learned that most hotels all around the world will have unique carpeting. So that's something that once you know, you know. And once you can look for let's say a hallway in a hotel and in this case we we got lucky we got a picture where a door of a hotel room was open so we could see a part of the carpeting we could do a reverse image search on that carpeting and it led us to a hotel chain somewhere in um, in, in asia and with that we were at least able to say hey local authorities there take a look because there may be some people in a hotel that are being there uh, held there against their will so i think it's so cool to that you point out that Sometimes it's not the entire picture that's important to you, but mm. it's that little nugget, that little unique identifying mm. label in there that, that's making it worthwhile. Right. 
And I mean, the, you know, this is kind of gamified sometimes, right? There's there's tools out there, there's quiz time and things like that where where you can practice these skills. But sometimes it doesn't have to be that hard. I mean, we're not going to get into EXIF and, and file data, but it could be that easy. Maybe there's a GPS <laughs> coordinates <laughs> embedded in the image. Um, but maybe it is something like that, that unique piece of Im that's in the image that you can just sort of key off of. Yeah. And so, uh, Nico and Stephen, I'll throw this out there just in general. So both of you have kind of mentioned finding some unique characteristics in photos and cases you've worked. Um, are there kind of what you consider go-to things that you're looking at when you're doing geolocation in a photo? Uh, or are there uh, maybe something really interesting you say, hey, this was maybe out there a little bit in edge case, but was a really interesting find. You know, Nico, you mentioned the carpet and Stephen mentioned things like drain pipes, but uh, really kind of where are people starting when they're doing this type of analysis? What is like, absolutely, this is where I'm going first. Okay, so I think you, you hit on it there. The, the key to being able to successfully geolocate an image or a video is uniqueness. Um, and the more unique detail there is an image, the easier it will be to find it. So things like license plates, for example, street signs are, are kind of really obvious ones. Um, you can get different architectural styles, certain trees, things like landscapes, the way people dress, which might, all these things which you can overlay and add together uh, can give you a, quite a, a bit of uniqueness. Um, and it's finding the details in the image um, which really make it work. And I think sometimes um, when people see others do geolocation, uh, it, it blows it blows people away sometimes. Like, how did they do that? How did they find that? And really, it's the skill of geolocation. I think is being able to look at an image and extract all that unique data from it that you can. And sometimes that's obvious. So if you have a picture of a plane and you see the tail registration on the plane, you can figure out where it is and where it flew, what dates. But it's the things that might be less less obviously unique that you can combine together. So when, when I teach this to people of, or when I've written about it before, um, an exercise we get people to do is you give them a photograph, which might appear to not have much detail in it, nothing obvious or generous like street signs, for example, and say, right, you have to find 20 pieces of information in this photograph. And most of the time people say, oh, I can't do that. Oh, it's possible. I can't find that. But if you force them to do it and look at it, you say, well, actually, there is a bus stop and there's an icon on the bus stop so we can find a transport company, so we can find a city. And there's these kinds of buildings in the background. And we can tell from the sun that the photographer was probably facing south. And there's satellite dishes, so we know they point towards the equator, so we can orientate the photograph. Or the road markings on the edge of the road only occur in these particular countries. Or the architectural style looks like this. Or these are a particular breed of tree, and they only grow in these certain places, and so on and so on. It's um, it's it's hard because it's hard to automate or write a tool for that process because it's it's really a thinking and, and an analysis skill. But that that's how we train people um, to to think to find those unique points which are going to make the geolocation easier i think it also has to do with with taking time right that's what i teach as well because sometimes people think when they need to geolocate it they need to find the location let's say within 15 minutes which in my personal experience is almost undoable for any picture um, you need to have a lot of tenacity, but you also, what I also encourage people to do is to buy good quality, high resolution computer screens. So to see more detail, maybe to play a little bit with the color depth or the color scheme overall, to see that little nugget that you just pointed out that you're looking for. So for me, um, I think it has mostly to do with tenacity and finding the unique things. And keep in mind that sometimes when you have a picture, you may also be able to find uh, a picture from the same day uh, from a different angle and that mm -hmm. will give you a little bit more this is why i always encourage people when uh, let's say a picture pops up on instagram or on twitter or on facebook try to see if that person who posted it is sharing more pictures about the same event because it could give you a different angle or maybe other people are talking about the same ongoing let's say um war crime or something like that and most likely you will even find moving footage so geolocation does not limit itself to a still image yeah absolutely and i 
I like what you touched on there about um, looking at the other photos they've taken. That's really important as well, because sometimes you can just get bogged down and fixated on one particular image. And you have to ask, well, who took this? Why did they take it? What's the original source, if you can get it? Because photos don't just come into being by themselves. There's always a reason they were taken. They will usually be part of a series of events uh, that when someone was traveling and so on and so on. And sometimes if you know who the photographer is, you can research a bit about them, where they live, where they go, um, and that will help you geolocate it. So yeah, absolutely. To be, don't be afraid to go a little bit wider to help you find uh, what you're looking for. Yeah, and it's not always exactly ocean. You could also reach out to the person who posted a photo and ask them, hey, where were you standing when you took the photo? So that's <laughs> yeah. just a crazy hit. Yeah, definitely always good to think outside the box on things like that. Uh, I think the image analysis and and geolocation is an interesting part of OSINT in that you really are kind of forced to do some analysis and assessment of the data to even make it work, right? Yeah. Yeah, but also looking at, at when you look at assessments um, with disinformation and fake news being everywhere, it's also now becoming more and more a task of people who do geolocation to try and figure out if the content has not been manipulated or altered. So, and there are, of course, tools out there, for example, the Invit tool, which can help you to find the same image, but also play around with um, their potential hints on has it been photoshopped or something like that. Do you have any info on this, Stephen? Yeah, so in Invid, uh, you've mentioned, is um, a really good tool for for ver for verifying things like that. But yeah, the one of the, I guess probably the fastest growing uh, use of geolocation has been in that kind of uh, disinformation verification space. And I think a lot of journalists have um, really taken this idea that um, we live. One of the challenges of of the modern age, I guess, is this is fake news, is disinformation. So a video or an image appears on Twitter and it accuses someone of a particular crime or it says some political group have been doing a particular thing. But actually geolocation has become a very powerful tool for proving or disproving whether these events uh, actually took place. Um, that, that And that's why I think I think Quiz Time, uh, which was probably one of the most prominent geolocation um game services trading platforms um has become so popular because it helps people develop those skills and it's kind of developed into almost its own industry like if you're talking about something like the conflict in ukraine right now like there are people that are basically just <laughs> doing image analysis and geolocation and sharing that data yeah this is why i like playing geogesher for example because it's basically a virtual dropping and it gets you it at least gets your brain and eye trained on how certain structures are where in the world or how certain roads are where in the world. It, it, for me, it really helped me to uh, quicker find certain locations based upon a picture or a piece of footage. And, uh, and also there's some great resources out there that will tell you, hey, in this country, um, they have this lining on the road. On this country, people have these kind of dishes on their walls and so, on, and so on and so forth. So there are so many good resources out there, which also makes it overwhelming for people starting out in geolocation. So that's that's kind of a nice segue, uh, Nico, thinking about kind of looking at road characteristics and things like that and getting more maybe into vehicle location. Uh, so again, we talked about some of the key characteristics you might have looking for geolocation. Um, so obvious ones we have for cars, right? Plates, but even certain models and makes are only sold in certain regions. Um, so Stephen or Nico or John, kind of what else do we have along those lines that we can use to help uh, find vehicles or even use, you know, kind of pivot back and forth, of course, vehicles to find a location or location for specific vehicles? What do we have? So there are there is an huge world of resources for finding, tracking, researching vehicles, uh, depending on wh where you are in the world um, as well, of course. But um, I'm glad you mentioned vehicles as a pivot um, point, because when we're researching vehicles in OSIN, it's usually because we're it's linked to something else that we are already interested in, like a particular company, a particular place, a particular event, and so on. And vehicles often be a part of that. Um, so in terms of locating vehicles, well, I think 
<laughs> there's so many, but um, one example um, where we use them in geolocation is the uniqueness of vehicle license plates, for example. So every country in the world has a different way of organizing uh, its license plates. So um, as worldlicenseplates.com will have a photograph of the license plates from every single country, both current and historic ones. So when you have an image and you're trying to work out where it's taken and there's a vehicle parked up, you can go and say, well, I think that looks like it's in Brazil or it's in this particular state in the US or those characteristics say that way it looks like a particular city in Africa, for example, and so on. So license plates, again, because they're unique, uh, both in the content and their style, uh, that's one of the one of my go to's for helping with geolocation, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I recently stumbled upon a case where I was not able to identify a specific car. And this is why I also stumbled upon a tool um, that helped me find the make and model of a car. So there's some artificial intelligence and machine learning out there that will help you find uh, a car. So let me try and look that up. So we will put that in the banner below so you can visit that page uh, yeah. while you guys discuss a little bit further. And even, you know, if you are doing image analysis and you have a vehicle, even if you can't see the license plate, there's absolutely ways to identify those vehicles and maybe get a part of the world because maybe that vehicle is only sold in Brazil or something like that. Yeah, so you want you want make and uh, make a model of vehicle. And uh, that, that's all that Nico mentioned. Um, I think it's called Carnet or something yeah, like that. Correct. Is, correct. Uh, is, is awesome. Uh, so when I was in... When I was in the police, really, um, in the early days of my career, before these tools really existed online, uh, we had one guy on our team who's complete car obsessive, and you could show him, like, the CCTV footage of a car, and he'd say, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a Vauxhall Astra, or that's a Ford Focus Mark II, you can tell from the spoiler, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but unfortunately, most people don't know someone like that <laughs> who has this encyclopedic knowledge of the shape and design of every single car. So actually, AI-based tools like Carnet um, are really, really helpful if you have um, a, an image or a bit of footage and you're trying to identify and make a model of a vehicle. And the, these AI-based systems, the more you feed them, the better they get. So they are not perfect, um, they're, but they're, they're pretty good and they keep getting better. And they'll probably yeah, and that's get you something or get you some options, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that I think that will become bigger and bigger within open source intelligence. I recently played with uh, a pay tool built by Shadow Dragon that's capable of looking at a picture and interpreting that picture and pointing you to where possibly in the world that picture could have been taken. And that by itself for me is amazing. Of course, these I think most AI tools come with, let's say, a pricing plan. Uh, and that's also something that is still part of open source intelligence, because if you can afford it, it's still an open source, so you can access it. But it really speeds up your process and it helps. And I think um, we should never solely rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning, but it really, really speeds up your process and it saves you time to do that proper analysis. Yeah. And Nico, this kind of harkens back to things like the Google Video Intelligence API. You know, we've used that for doing video analysis, but certainly you can take it and train it up with your own data sets. So again, you could train it with a set of cars, right? It, same yeah. thing if you're building something in house and if you're a, a company that doesn't want to use these public resources, so there are lots of options out there. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it comes down to a balance between, I mean, obviously if you do a lot of geolocation stuff, you kind of have in your mind certain things about, you know, okay, that looks like it's in a, a country near the equator or something. There's palm trees and things like that. Or like the car thing. I mean, if you don't have, like I have a background with cars from doing surveillance for a long time and looking at a lot of cars and kind of being a car guy. So I still have friends that ask me to help identify vehicles. But if you don't have that, having the access to some of those tools that can help you, uh, it's really useful. Yeah. 100%. So we, um, another thing that I think when we talk about these things and these hard to find things, I remember vividly when I was doing a lot of counterterrorism work, for example, that um, I had to deal with, let's say, remote desert like locations where there's basically not those 20 things to see that you just mentioned, uh, Stephen, where you give people a challenge, say, hey, 
uh, look at 20 details, but if you end up somewhere in a desert or at a beach, it can be pretty challenging. And this is where sometimes, um, uh, again, little nuggets can come in useful. And I, I just want to, to tell you one story because uh, maybe that will get you onto a story as well, where I was tasked to find a, um, a terrorist group uh, from which two of the group members were from my country. So we tried to keep our co country safe. We tried to figure it out. Um, I got some footage, moving footage, and I spent weeks looking at that location with the team. We could not find it until I saw a little bird in that footage. And that bird triggered me. That was basically my unique identifying label, something that I could search with. And then I figured out there are literally apps out there that you can literally point at your screen or you can take a screenshot and say, hey, where does this bird come from and where does it live and where does it spend most of its time around the world? And it pointed me into Syria, into a specific region in Syria. And with that, I was at least able to pinpoint, let's say, a rough location where most likely that rebel group was active at that moment in time. Do you know of any other experiences like that where that little thing and that led you to finding something specific? I know about, for example, plant apps that you can point to something and that kind of stuff. Yeah, th there are there are loads of resources. Um, and it, this is going to sound like a bit of a lazy shortcut, but th for things like identifying plants, animals, all kinds of objects, um, I recently started to use Google Lens a bit more. Um, because I, a Google Lens, which is, is something separate from Google Images, um, it used to only be available on a phone. Now it's available in the Chrome browser. Um, it's built in there. You can point it at a particular object in an image or an image that you cropped, and it's pretty good at telling you what something is. Um, and so you could show it either on your phone if you were outside of the plant or if you were an image of a plant, for example, Google, Google Lens is quite good at identifying what species of something is. So um, I pre previously, if I was trying to identify um, particular types of wildlife, trees, plants, and so on, I would probably have to get the like the plant encyclopedia or website out to try and identify it. Um, but actually, Google Lens has, in, in the past couple of years, started to make that kind of thing um, a little bit easier. Um, it's still hard going uh, and it still throws up false positives, which we have to verify, of course. But um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's done a lot of the heavy lifting in the past couple of years. So that also <laughs> reminds me of those two. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, David. No, no I was just going to say along those lines, I think uh, Wolfram, Alpha, uh, Wolfram Alpha has a project that's very similar where you can kind of throw something in there and kind of basically say, what is this? And uh, get some things. But again, still prone to false positives, still a limited data set. But yeah. Uh, at least gives you a starting point, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of what we're dealing with is pulling threads and trying to, you know, actually make those uh, representations. So please, Nico, go ahead. Well, it reminded me your story just now, Stephen, of your uh, two blog series on Overpass Turbo. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Because I, for me, when you first wrote about it, that was really for my eye opener. I was not aware of the power of Overpass Turbo. And it's a really cool tool. Yeah. Tell so us yeah. please tell us more. <laughs> Um, overpass Turbo is um, probably the best kept secret in, in geolocation and geographic intelligence. Um, it's it's huge, but um, basically, it's all it all originates from a project called OpenStreetMap, which we, is a community open source project where people will upload geographical information from all over the world, uh, and it's grown over the years. Um, so it's absolutely huge. So um, we'll show you. It, it, to look at it, to look at OpenStreetMap, superficially, it looks just like Google Maps or, or Bing Maps. But the way the data is structured underneath um, is incredibly highly detailed. So you can know where every road is, what the speed limit is on that road, what sort of road it is, um, what the buildings are nearby, what their usage, how many stories high they are, which administrative district they're in, and so on and so on and so on. There is a huge database um, and, and people use it for, I use it for geolocation, but people mostly use it for things like planning projects and things like that. Um, but it is possible to query this vast database um, through a, a website called Overpass Turbo. So let's say, for example, um, I'm doing a geolocation challenge and I, I can't figure out where a place is, but I can see, well, I can see 
a swimming pool that is um, close to a cafe, maybe about 100 meters away, and they are in turn maybe 50 meters from a main road. And I think from the architecture, they're probably in France, let's say. So I can go to Overpass Turbo and say, show me, like build my query and say, show me all the swimming pools that are within 100 meters of a house, which is within 50 meters of a main road and in the country of France. And it will go away, it, it chug away for a few minutes and it will produce on a map all the possible locations where all those data points intersect. Um, and you can narrow it down to, to two or three locations, depending on um, how well you can refine your query. So it's overpass turbo is very, very powerful. Um, the downside to overpass turbo is it, it's quite a steep learning curve. So you can't just, if you're used to doing things on Google maps, you can't just type restaurants near me and get a load of restaurants. That's not how it works. You have to understand um, how all the objects in over in OpenStreetMap are labeled, but there are free resources um, which will tell you how all the labels are constructed. So if I want to search for mobile phone masts, I need to know what the label is for a mobile phone mast so I can add that to my search. Um, but as long as you can, you know roughly what you're looking for and what the what the, so and how OpenStreetMap describes these objects, so you know the syntax for a swimming pool or a football stadium or a train line and so on. You can put all these things into Overpass Turbo and it will bring up the locations for you. Um, so it is, it's very, very, once you once you get your head around the syntax and make lots of mistakes along the way, um, as, I, as I certainly do, it's a very, very powerful tool for finding things. Yeah, and if people want to learn more, they should definitely go out to your website, nixintel.info, because you wrote a two series blog, right? Yeah, I um, I wrote a couple of uh, blog posts about uh, Overpass Turbo, and it goes through right from the beginning, explaining how all the data is structured, and um, so you know how to search, and then how you can make simple queries, and then move on from there to make more complex queries, um, so that you can find what you're looking for. Yeah, It's not a perfect tool um, by any means, Overpass Turbo. It's only as good as the information that people have uploaded over time. Uh, but it's very, very powerful and very, very accurate uh, for finding yeah. information for sure. Yeah, and that and that reminds me because you made a comment that it's only as good at uh, as the the content that people uploaded and labeled, and that also reminds me of another tool called Mapillary or Mapillary. I don't know how you, how to pronounce it, yeah. but for me that has really be be a, a game changer and saved me because sometimes there is no let's say street view available. Um, on mapping tools. And this is where Mapillary, basically, quote unquote, the poor man street view comes in, where people in remote locations can take an effort to film or photograph the location and help you pivot or verify the location uh, where you want to look into. So um, that is something that maybe some of the listeners definitely want to check out as well. Yeah, and I will add um, CarterView to that as well. I'll, I'll share the link shortly. But uh, CarterView is very similar to Mapillary in that it goes to places where um, where Google Street View either doesn't cover, in places like Germany, for example, or the coverage is not up to date. And uh, the users are basically incentivized to go around with their, their app on their phone, drive around, and capture as many images of the road as they can and there's leaderboards and points and, and things like that mm -hmm. so that that has created a a searchable street level view ground level view um, image database that we can use sometimes with entertaining results since these are guys just driving around with their cell phone <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, you do, you do wonder sometimes <laughs> yeah um so we're talking about roads and overpasses and things, which brings me back a little bit to the vehicles. Um, you know, Stephen, you worked in law enforcement. I worked as a private investigator. So we had access to tools and DMV records and things that aren't necessarily OSINT, right? So if we are looking at a vehicle, and I understand it's different if you have a license plate from, say, France and one from the United States or Australia, but what are some of the ways, like, how might we pivot to, say, a VIN? Or how might we find other pivots from a license plate or a make and model um, from open source, open data? 
Yeah, there are there are lots of different tools that do this, and it depends on on the country where you are. But um, license plates, are, although they're unique, they're not always persistent. So sometimes if someone buys a car um, and they might have a, a private plate they want to put on there, or they might move it to a different location and they have to have a different plate. Um, but you mentioned a VIN there, which is the vehicle identification number, which is a long alphanumeric number, which is usually stamped on the chassis of the car and various other places. That's the unique persistent identifier um, for cars. Um, so whatever vehicle research you're doing, that is arguably even more important than the license plate um, because it, that doesn't change um, but very often. And it depends what country you're in. Um, but certainly here in the UK, and I know in different states in the US and places in Europe, it's usually possible to find public databases run by the government um, where you can enter a license plate and get a VIN number mm -hmm. back. Um, and that VIN number is you then becomes your pivot point to do lots of other additional searches, uh, depending on what you're looking for. So um, in the US, for example, if you're concerned about that your car has been stolen or if it's been involved in an accident, um, there is a site called, it's going to come to me in a minute. Um, <laughs> I will drop the link in chat in a moment, but it will Carfax. basically- Carfax. Yeah. Carfax. No, that's not the one I think. I know there are uh, Poctra. That's what I'm thinking of, poctra.com. Um, you can put your VIN in there and it will tell you um, basically what happened to this car after it was crashed, after it was, uh, if it was stolen, things like that, because it's a database of VIN numbers um, where cars have gone to salvage, for example. So if I bought the car quite cheaply and I put the VIN number in there and I would probably find that I've just bought a car that's been written off in an accident or something like that. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned uh, vehicle car facts, uh, vehiclehistory.com. There are lots of very, very similar sites in different countries that um, make use of this ability to search license and plates, but, but VIN numbers in particular. Um, so yeah, you don't want to uh, you don't want to see your car on Poctra. Yeah, and do not forget about car spotting databases or any vehicle spotting databases where people all around those car enthusiasts like you, your former colleague. Uh, we'll take an effort to walk in the street, see a wonderful brand new car or a very special car, take a picture, tell you exactly where they took that picture at what moment in time. And it can really help you find uh, a location uh, based or, upon that car. Or, or other sources like one of the, uh, the one of our viewers on the stream mentioned, you know, municipal traffic cameras and things like that. Um, there are other places where you can collect information from whether video or other kinds of imagery um, and you you might be able to search those in some cases too yeah that's a, that's a great point John because I know in the county where I live they have a big um, data openness push so anything that happens so things like parking tickets or any of those things can have potential pivot points around this vehicle was at this location at this time received a citation type thing so it's uh, really depends on where you are. Uh, and what the sharing restrictions may be on that data. In this case, this is, you know, we're talking about data that's considered to be part of the course of operations. It doesn't have the PII for the owner of the vehicle, but it certainly gives you a lead in that direction. Uh, so Stephen and Nico, like being over in the, well, no longer both in the EU, I guess, in the EU and the UK, um, you know, what, uh, there's certainly different data protections in there. Um, but uh, in terms of trying to make that link, maybe from a, then you know kind of fall follow, follow on that track license uh license plate to then to owner that's a pretty tough climb sometimes well for yeah, me it, looking it, owner yeah. no i don't think so you steven in some cases you can and this is uk specific Gen the general rule is no you can't right um in some cases if you're an accident investigator or a certain kinds of private investigator or you're in a car park you can pay a small fee and find out who the keeper of a vehicle is just based on the on the license plate but that, the access to that is quite is quite controlled mm -hmm. um one that this is a complete approaching it from a completely different viewpoint um but another technique that's quite useful that people may not be aware of is um actually using facebook because facebook's inbuilt image search tool is able to pick out text from within all the millions and millions of images that's uploaded there. So actually, if you 
if you have a vehicle and you have a vehicle license plate, you can often put the license plate into Facebook. And if anyone has ever taken a photo of that vehicle because they're proud of it, because they just bought it, or they put it on Facebook Marketplace and, uh, and they took a photo of it, anything like that, Facebook can often pull out the vehicles where other services will not. Um, so if you are, if, if you have just a license plate or even a partial license plate, try searching for it on, within Facebook photos. Um, that, that has become more useful uh, as time has gone by. Yeah, I actually had some success stories with that because I remember vividly when there were some demonstrations in the Netherlands where it was not about cars, but it was people holding up those banners during demonstrations. And I was trying to geolocate exactly where they were standing with those banners and I could not find it. But I tried to find looking for pictures from different angles and I simply typed in what was on those banners and Facebook showed me three additional pictures that I could not find. Uh, on other social media, but now I found it. And with that, I was capable of geolocating it. I think, if I recall right, they use um, Rosetta's text extraction system. Yeah, I so believe so, yeah. Standard, uh, yeah, pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, that, that optical character recognition from imagery is a pretty cool new tool that we're seeing more uh, and more available from, from things like Facebook, mm -hmm. like you said, and, and other resources too. So maybe tracking back here for a second, question that popped in the comments, and maybe we'll use this as a, a way to think about dealing with. So we have an image. Um, certainly, we know EXIF data pretty easily tampered. We don't trust that on its own. We look for other sources of verification. But when dealing with you know trying to do verification or geolocation of the image, how can we assess up front whether or not we think that image has been tampered with? Uh that, that that can be a little bit tricky to do, but if you have if you have EXIF data in an image, uh, and if, if people watching this are not familiar with EXIF data, uh, essentially when you take a photo with your phone or with a camera, it will stamp um, extra information into that image file, and that will often include the GPS coordinates of the image, which is awesome because if we could always have that, uh, we we would never geolocation as you know wouldn't exist. Um, the reality is that a most services, platforms, social media sites that you upload these images to will have that data removed. And the second issue is it's really easy to fake or alter that data and provide false GPS coordinates in there. So a couple of ways that around dealing with that. One, which is harder, is always try and work with an, an original image where possible, though in reality, unless you're working in, in digital forensics, for example, um, it's unlikely you'll be able to get an real original image. The second much more common sense way to deal with it is not taking those GPS coordinates, the EXIF value, uh, uh, the EXIF data at face value. You don't just accept it. You have to verify it and check mm -hmm. it as with any other kind of evidence. And so if you have GPS coordinates in a photo and that show it was taken on this particular beach, well, then you need to take those coordinates, put them into a mapping service and say, does that actually match? If it does, great unlikely that it was tampered with. If it doesn't match and it shows you somewhere else or the coordinates aren't real, um, then you know that it's been tampered with or altered. So as, as always, that it just comes down to verifying what you're and checking what the information you're provided with and not just accepting it at face value. Sure. Uh, you know, maybe let me restate this a little bit. So I have an image, EXIF data aside, um, if you're concerned about the veracity of that image, in other words, has it been altered before I've seen it? You talked about trying to work with the original. Are there characteristics I can look for in an image that might tell me, hey, this has been Photoshopped, for example? But you know, non-obvious things like, where, you know, if I was to put myself standing on the moon, that's a pretty clear, <laughs> you know, uh, Photoshop. But uh, things that are perhaps more subtle that are in the use of propaganda campaigns, for example. Like the, this person does not exist. The eyes are kind of always in the same place kind of things like right. that. Yeah. And I know that's probably a larger problem to discuss. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily directly related to what we're talking about today, but that is one of the concerns we have is how do we know the, the authenticity of what we're dealing with? Yeah, there actually was an article in the news this week where some, um, I think, Russian 
uh, identification documents were being posted online for people being caught and they were clearly tampered with. So some very smart people on the internet took the time to examine that photo, maybe on a little bit more ocean forensic level and started looking at on a pixel level depth, seeing, hey, uh, is this face being photoshopped into the document? Because if you zoom in enough on a, on a pixel level, you could see that maybe, well, I'm bald, but especially with people with hair or longer hair, it's sometimes pretty hard to get those small little um, loose hairs uh, correct in that photo. And that could be a tell, for example, or the color scheme may be off, or um, they all have the same uh, date and time stamp. That could be a tell, those small little nuggets again. You guys are obviously protected from the hair thing, but <laughs> hope so. <laughs> Lifetime immunity, yeah. <laughs> There are there are some um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but some sort of photo forensics tools mm -hmm. and software. There are some web resources online as well where you can you know can analyze an image and and find apparent uh, alterations or things that. Yeah. You can actually do it also within Invit. Invit, the extension that you can run in your Chrome or Firefox browser, has photo forensics, and it will show you, for example, if someone uh, played around with colorization, pixel depth, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, you know, as it's becoming more popular, as, you know, in the last five or 10 years, there's, of course, a lot more imagery and information coming online. Um, so more people are using it, more people are relying upon it. So we do need to uh, make sure that we are validating that information. We're finding all sorts of tools or adding like my company recorded future. Uh, in the last couple of years has added images uh, before it was all just text data. So there's so many resources that are adding imagery um, that this is becoming something that, that I think a lot of OSINT investigators yeah. and researchers will be running across right yeah mm. yeah I think, yeah, and i think sorry go ahead Steve. i was i was going to say that i think if we have this conversation again in in five or ten years time we will be talking about the challenges of deep of the really good deep fakes and we, we've seen them now like audio deep fakes photo obviously fake photos fake videos and you're kind of relying on your just your sensors a bit to spot the fakes but as they get better um they'll become really uh, really quite challenging. I dare say we will develop tools and techniques for dealing with them, but I, I see those as a, a very significant challenge. It won't be just a case of, oh, this is Photoshop because it's a bit blurred around the edges. Um, yeah. Some of those are, are really quite good and will be a big challenge for us in the future, mm -hmm. for sure. No, I, and, and I still think the most um, cases where I've dealt with have to deal with deep fake or fake news in general is uh, me figuring that out nine out of ten times had to do with looking at who posted this and what is their interest of yeah. posting this information? So it could sometimes the account itself could be an obvious tell, hey, this account has a very clear agenda to spread this or misinformation, or at least try to deceive the reader on this picture or the headline does not match up with the actual content, that kind of stuff. So it does not always have to do with you actually having to analyze the picture itself, but Everything that's around that picture could also be helpful in finding that. Context is important, right? Yeah. Right. That kind of goes back to your reliability ratings of your source evidence. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, this has been a great discussion today. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Any final thoughts or, or things you want to uh, mention? Now, other other than to say it's uh, it's been really great to be here and uh, discuss this. I I love talking about geolocation. I, I love to talk about OSINT, um, and occasionally I have time to write about it as well. So if you had a, if you've enjoyed what uh, we've talked about today, then head on to over to my blog, um, and there are probably two or three years worth of articles on geolocation techniques uh, in there, which uh, I hope people will find useful. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, if you're not following. Uh... Stephen on Twitter at Nick's Intel. Give him a follow. Check out his blogs. A lot of really cool data that he has shared there and will continue to, I'm sure. Uh, Nico, David, any final thoughts from you guys? Yeah, great well, conversation. Just, uh, love it. Yeah. And I just learned a lot again. So uh, I love learning. This is why I love these live streams. Always new stuff to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, listen, thank you to Stephen, Nico, and David, as well as everyone who joined us on the stream. 
Uh, we had a great discussion today, and we'll see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.